Welcome to the live service from Family Worship Center. Family Worship Center is located at Jimmy Swagger Ministries in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. This service is also available live on Sun Life Radio and online at sunlifetv.com. We'll have praise and worship from the Family Worship Center singers and musicians, a time for prayer, plus the anointed preaching of God's Word. Now let's go live to the Family Worship Center Sanctuary as the service begins. Hallelujah, hold him to his nail scarred hands, hold him to his nail scarred hands. I said one more river to cross, one more mountain to climb, one more valley that I gotta go through, leaving my troubles behind. God hands, I'm gonna sing. Hey, one more river to cross. 
people talking about me since I walked this narrow way. This is just another little valley. I came through it when I prayed. I climbed a lot of high mountains, crossed a long little streams. But when I see your joy, I got one more battle with that old devil I'm gonna make him understand
He makes me want to shout and he makes me want to praise him too. He makes me want to worship him. So let's do that now. Let's, let's focus our attention on just bringing him into the heart. Let's sing praises to him. I sing praises to your name. Praises to you. 
together this morning hallelujah we're here to worship the Lord praise God before you sitting down if the election for governor of Louisiana was being held on Monday Trent Domain would be the runaway winner as a write-in candidate some of you don't have the slightest idea what I'm talking about just watch the rerun from last night's LSU game he scored the winning touchdown on a trick play for LSU. Who is LSU? Oh, you know who LSU is because you was up watching the game. And we may have some guests from Florida today. I don't mean to offend you, but go Tigers! All right, turn around and shake hands with somebody and welcome them into the service this morning. Amen. We're glad to see you this morning. We welcome everyone joining us by Sun Live Broadcasting Network, wherever in the world, television, radio, internet, wherever in the world that you are watching from. And uh, we're so glad to have each and every one of you reminding everyone, turn off your cell phones or any other electronic uh, devices. Once again, share is continuing Monday and Tuesday, and we need operators desperately. If you could give us three or four hours of your time, we would appreciate it. The Crossfire Fall Youth Rally is Saturday, October the 31st, uh, right here in the auditorium. Starts at 6 p.m. All you that live in an hour Hour, two hour, three hour driving distance. It's open for all ages. You need to come out and be a part of what the Lord is doing. Before we welcome in our media church members this morning, we have the privilege of dedicating a brand new member of Family Worship Center. We want Jonathan and Lynette Ferguson to bring Isabella Marie Ferguson to the platform. What a beautiful name, Isabella Marie Ferguson, are they here this morning? Are they here? Did they miss their own dedication? Well, I dedicate you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, wherever on planet Earth you may be. <laughs> in the name of the Lord. All right, we welcome this morning 65 brand new Family Worship Center Media Church members. Arizona, Martha, Arkansas, Judy and Martha, California, Clayton, Dwana, Kathy, Kenneth, Paul, Tommy, Florida, Jeanette, Justin, Sheila, Illinois, Barbara, Robert, Indiana, Leanne, Miracle. From Louisiana, Cherylyn and Mary. From Maryland, Helen and Jephthah. From Michigan, Christine and Dorleen and Fern. From Mississippi, Ellis and Nancy, from Missouri, Dennis, Donna, Harold, and Robert, from New Mexico, Karen, from New York, Jose, from North Carolina, Jamie, Johnny, Linda, Mary Jane, and Shirley, from Oklahoma, Joseph, from Pennsylvania, Frank, Joyce, Sally, and Victoria, from South Carolina, Darlene, and Deborah, from Tennessee, Janet, Leon, Linda, and Mary. From Texas, Cynthia, David, Jason, Casey, Linda, Mark, Michelle. From Utah, Paul, Peggy. From Virginia, Fern, Joseph. From Washington, Cheryl, Karen, Patricia, Trang. From West Virginia, Leroy, Terry. From Wisconsin, Cheryl. Now let's stand Family Worship Center. Give these folks a great big warm welcome to Family Worship Center Media Church. Praise the Lord. Amen. How many of you saw the uh, 60th anniversary special last night? Wasn't that good? 
And part two will be airing next Saturday night. That's the 24th at 6 p.m. Central Time. Or if you didn't, if you missed it, you can go online, I'm sure, and watch it in the archives. But it, it was absolutely fantastic. Part two will be even better. So be sure and tune in. Tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to have another great service. Family Worship Center, Resurrection Choir, and Singers. <laughs>
vad nu man lo He's gonna make be seated. As far as the eye could see, potentates, kings, generals, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of the subjects of Nebuchadnezzar were in Babylon. The orchestra was given instructions to play, and when they did, Every person has to bow, everyone, to Nebuchadnezzar and to the god Bell. The brightness of the Babylonians and the band played and the thousands upon thousands fell on their faces except three. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he said, fellas, you're part of my administration. I've been good to you. People are here from all over the empire, the most powerful people on the earth, and they have bowed, and you won't bow? No, Sir King, we respect you. We respect your office. But we can bow only to one. And his name is Jehovah. He said, you must be talking about Daniel's God. Yeah, I'm talking about Daniel's God. Well, boys, I'm sorry, but uh, if you don't bow, they're going to put you in a fiery furnace. They said, King, we may burn, but we'll never bow. Well, what's going to happen then? I don't know, but I know this. I know the Lord will make a way. For me
And thank God he set me free. I know the Lord will make a way. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, yes, for me. Oh, yes, for me. If you need prayer, I want you to come. We still believe that Jesus Christ heals the sick. We still believe that he delivers. We believe he sets the captive free. And Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Father, we pray for everyone who has walked up here and everyone by television 
everyone by the internet, by radio, wherever, whomever, however, whatever their problem is, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask for healing. You said the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. We claim that. We claim deliverance right now in Jesus' name for those who need it. And we say it all in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said amen and amen. Oh, praise God. Give the Lord a hand of praise. We welcome you so much this morning. Uh, Carolyn, could I get you to bring CC up here, if you will, please? That's good. Praise the Lord. And uh, we just, my wife told me that this tie I've got on matches anything but me. And she said, Don, you look like an overgrown water lily. She's Pentecostal, you have to understand. <laughs> now, the reason I've done this is this week, uh, Cece had a birthday. She's two years old. And Jill, would you stand, please? And then Carolyn, would you stand? There she is back there. Jennifer, would you stand, please? Right back there, yes. And Donnie, would you stand, please? Now give me the key of C, if you will, please. Well, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. To you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you, to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you, to you. Happy birthday to all of you. Happy birthday. It's been a long time since I've been two years old. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, well, of course, we, we love these little ones very, very much. And praise the Lord. And I don't care what Francis says. I think my tie looks pretty good anyway. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I just, if it goes around your neck, that's fine. That's all I know. I'm, I'm blessed if I can get both shoes the same color. Because she says, well, you just don't care how you look. I said, I'm not especially interested in it. That is true. I'm more interested in how I feel, and I feel good this morning in the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, glory. Martha, would you come and bless these people?
are gone You see change cannot threaten The ego that's flown And oh, my past, it's forgotten Oh yes, yes. It's a lost memory And there's no guilt, there's no guilt to remind me for at last I am free Oh, and I have gone to the It was great, and grace was free. Hallelujah. Pardon there, it was multiplied to me. And there, there my burdened soul, it found a God, praise God, mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Glory to God. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf our God did span at Calvary. You know, they say that that Socrates, in his brilliance, finally came to the conclusion there is good and there is evil and we are evil. He was right. His student, Plato, said, yes, we are good and we are evil. And there is a great gulf between the two. Aristotle, Plato's student, said, we are evil and there is good. There's a great gulf between the two and we do not know how to cross that gulf to get to the side that is good. 
I could tell, Mr. Socrates, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty guff our God did span at Calvary. The cross, the cross pushed over that chasm and brought us to the place that the righteousness of God could be given unto us. My Lord, hallelujah to the Lamb. Let's receive the tithe and the offerings. Please give the Lord a hand. And thank you so very, very much, not only here, but all over the world for the gifts that you gave Thursday and Friday. We're so appreciative, and we pray God's richest, richest blessings upon you. We have a ways to go, but by the grace of God, we're going to get there. Yes, we will. Could you stand, please? Heavenly Father, I thank you for these people. I ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless every, every one of them. Touch them, lift them up, strengthen them. Whatever need that person has, I'm asking you to provide it according to your riches that be in glory by Christ Jesus. And we say it all in the name of Christ Jesus. And everyone said amen and amen. Could I get you to come, please? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, where could I go? Where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. This song has blessed a lot of people. And this is what it says. Oh, something beautiful, something good, oh, my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. He made something beautiful of my life. there were ever dreams that were lofty and true. They were my dreams at the start and the hope for life's best. But those dreams turned to ashes. My fortune turned to loss. So I wrapped it all up and I laid it 
at the foot of the cross. Something beautiful Something Oh my confusion He understood was broken and strong but he made something beautiful of my There ever were dreams that were lofty and so true. They were my dreams at the start and the hopes for life's best. But those dreams turned into ashes My fortune turned to loss So I wrapped it all up in the rags of my life And laid it, I laid it at the cross
Aren't you glad he made something beautiful out of your life this morning? Great song written by Bill Gaither. Open your Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50 begins with the final days of the life of the great patriarch Joseph, a type of Jesus Christ. I'm not really dealing this morning with the text that I'm reading you, the event of the text, I am dealing with a statement that Joseph made, inspired by the Holy Spirit that is for us today, just as it was for him. But it, it is important for you, and one of the things that I know the Lord has laid upon dad's heart to do, and I know it's God, and that is to write the books that he's been writing on these great patriarchs of the faith. If you can, if you understand, if you can see and know the life of these great patriarchs, their failures and their victories, when you see how the Lord works in their life, that's how he works in our life. We, we should never put these men on a pedestal that they are some type of supermen. They're flesh and blood, just like you and I. But God took nothing and made something beautiful out of it. And so, Dad wrote a book about Joseph. As I've said, he's one, a type of Christ, one of the greatest types of Christ found in the Old Covenant. And I, I, I don't have time in the message to go through all the great things of Joseph's life. So here's what we're doing in the bookstore after the service. This book is 50% off. 50% off the regular retail price. Every single one of you, you need to get a copy of it. Those of you watching, we want to make it available to you, watching by television, listening by radio, watching by internet. It's available internet only. You can't call, you can't write. If you go online, www.sunlifetv.com, we will honor that 50% discount. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this, Brother Donnie? You need the information. You need the information. It will help you. Genesis chapter 50. Beginning with verse 14, and Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father, after he had buried his father. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespasses of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now, therefore, fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. And I want to minister just for a few minutes this morning on the subject. God meant it for good. God meant it 
for good. Would you bow your heads? Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the spirit of the Lord that we feel in the house of the Lord. We're asking this morning that you would anoint me to minister, anoint me to deliver this, which you gave to me a week ago in Brasilia, Brazil, for this service this morning. Help me to articulate, to say it exactly the way that you desire it to be said. Take it to the hearts of your people and let it be a word of encouragement into, the, into their hearts and lives. And we give you all the praise and glory. And everybody said, amen and amen. The text that I read to you in that specific verse that I'm taking the title of my message for, it tells us two specific facts that are found throughout the Bible, the Word of God. It is a fact of life in every single Christian. And those two facts are, number one, Satan is going to try to bring evil against the child of God. Now understand that. There's no ifs, there's no ands about it. Satan, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And I don't care who you are and where you are, if you're a child of God, Satan is hatching and creating and concocting evil plans against you. Peter would write in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, he said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. If you're saved, you're in a war and you know it. There are evil powers, demon spirits, allying against you to hinder you. And I could spend a lot of time, but I don't want to. I want to get to the second truth that is brought out in the text. And that is, no matter what evil Satan has in mind to bring against you, no matter what evil he has brought against you, no matter what battle you find yourself in right now, I'm here to tell you, God will turn it to your good if you believe him. Now, do you understand what I'm saying, church? I don't care spiritual, physical, financial, domestic, emotional. I don't care what it is. If you don't give up, if you don't quit, if you don't throw in the towel, if you don't bow the knee to Baal, I'm here to tell you, there's not a devil, there's not a demon spirit in hell that can bring that evil to pass. God will take that which is evil and will turn it for our good. Somebody needs to praise the Lord. I mean... Just read 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. Samuel, the prophet of God, is sitting in the dirt crying. And the Lord of glory says, Why are you sitting here mourning? M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Seeing I have rejected Saul. Fill your horn with oil and go. For I have provided. For I have provided. For I have provided a king in the house of Jesse. The prophet was crying and God was planning. Oh, are you dead this morning? Are you even breathing this morning? Some of you are sitting in the dirt weeping and crying, not knowing what's going to happen. But the creator of heaven and earth right now is planning blessing and victory for you. I'm not going to talk about evil. I'm not going to give Satan any due. We're in a battle. We're in a fight. But I've come this morning to give praises to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm here to proclaim the one that saved you, healed you, delivered you. He's the one through David said the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. And though he fall, he will not let him go. He will hold him by the power of his right hand. I'm not here to give the devil glory. I'm here to give Jesus some glory. The devil 
tried to make it evil for the children of Israel in Egyptian bondage. But God turned it to good and brought them out victorious without the help of an army or a sword, a shield, and a spear. When they were hungry, he fed them in the wilderness. When they were thirsty, he gave them water out of a rock to drink. When they didn't, didn't know where to go, he gave them a cloud by day and fire by night. Oh, come on, church. He was watching over them. He was protecting them. He was keeping them. And the same God that watched over Israel is the same God that watches over every single child of God in the world today. When you got up this morning, he was watching over you. When you got in your car to come to church, he was watching over you. When you walked in the building, he was watching over you. When you go home today, he's watching over you. While the devil is plotting your destruction, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of David, the God of Moses, the God of Isaiah, of Jeremiah, of Ezekiel, of Matthew, of Mark, of Luke, Paul, John. He is watching over you. The one who anointed David is your anointer. Hallelujah. We serve a big God. However big your problem is, our God is bigger. There's no God like our God. There's no God like our God. There's no God like Jehovah. Hallelujah. Well, man, he's still saving. He's still healing. He's still delivering. He's still taking nothing and making something out of it. In, 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 in Hebrew, the text actually says this. As Joseph replied to his brethren, as you were thinking or meditating evil against me, Elohim was thinking or meditating for good. But you don't know what I did, Brother Donnie. Forget what you did. And look at what he did 2,000 years ago. That was for our good. Every drop of blood that was shed was for our good. Satan had thought evil against humanity, but God turned it to good. Hallelujah. I, I mean, just read the Bible. Just read the Bible and how many times a man of God, a woman of God, the people of God were down for the count. And Satan was counting them out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Wait a minute, Lazarus is supposed to be dead, but I see him coming out of that tomb. Bartimaeus is supposed to be blind, but I see him walking. The lame man sitting by the gate, beautiful, is no longer a cripple, but he's walking, he's leaping, he's running, he's dancing. Just read the Bible. told somebody the other day, I said, just read the Bible. It's amazing what you'll learn. Boy, I got, I, I got a good one. I got a good one to show you how God watches over for good. I got a good one. It's not just a, a, a fair story. It's a good one. It's a real good one. It's a really, 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 really good one. With hot fudge and almonds on the top. 1945. 
The war in Europe finally ended. Hundreds of thousands of Americans, Army, Army Air Corps, Marines, Navy, whatever, begin to come home. Tons and tons and tons and tons of military equipment shipped back. So many airplanes shipped back from the European theater of operations that there really was, there was no way to use them all. And they literally went out and parked them in the desert in Nevada. Thousands B-24s, B-17s, bombers, P-51 Mustangs, P-31 Lightnings, Corsairs just lined up. America was celebrating. But as that war ended in places like Auschwitz, Treblinka, Dachau, through parts of Germany and Poland, Hitler's death camps that he had designed for the final solution to destroy the people of God. You shouldn't call them the people of God. They were in rebellion. Yeah, they're in rebellion, but they're still God's people. And I will bless those who bless, and I will curse those who curse. They didn't have a home. If you ever go to Berlin, as I have, one of the most moving things that you can go see besides the, where the Berlin Wall was, Checkpoint Charlie, I've actually got pieces of the Berlin Wall in my possession. One of the most moving things I did when I was there was when I went through the Jewish Museum is they begin to give the rich history of the contribution that the Jewish people made to German life in medicine, science, the arts, law. The list just went on and on and then all the way up to the day of Hitler and the persecution. And how that everything was taken from them, shipped off to concentration camps. And as they got enough strength, because when, when we discovered these concentration camps, and I, I, I actually came this close to having TV run pictures, but they're so, they're so graphic, I just decided some of you couldn't take it. Men and women that were literally skin and bones. They, they, they literally could not let them out. This, it, 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 it warped their mind for a moment because their liberators come, the Americans. They find these camps, they open the gates, and walking corpses stagger up to them. And they want to leave, and yet American doctors say, you can't let them out. You cannot let them out. They'll die. We have got to slowly nourish them back to life. You've, you've got to, we, they've got disease. They are, or their bodies are filled with disease, and, and they couldn't understand this. They saw their liberator, and in their minds for a season, the liberator became the captive, and they, they couldn't understand. But they had to be nursed back. Their bodies had to be given the vitamins and the nutrients that two, three, four years of these Nazi death camps had taken from their body. Do you know what it's like to look at a physical human being and you know it's a human being standing before you, but you literally can see the skeletal system? Because they have no meat on their bones, on their body. 
And as their strength came back, some of them wanted to go back to Warsaw, to Hamburg, to Berlin, to Leipzig, but there began to be a stir in the hearts of thousands of them. That cry was one word, Jerusalem. We want to go home. We want to go to Jerusalem. Our State Department, our Secretary of the State at the time, George Marshall, was anti-Semitic. He hated Israel or the formation of the state. He did everything in his power to stop President Truman from 1948 voting in the UN to recognize Israel as a nation. Even to the point of telling him, if you tell, if you vote yes, I will not support you in your reelection for president. But thank God, Truman had some backbone. But even though in 1948 we recognized Israel as a state, England and other European powers did everything they could to stop Jews from coming back into the homeland. They called it Palestine then. It's a fake name made up by the English rulers of that time. To call it Palestine, as they're trying to do today, it is a false name. There is no such thing as Palestinians. There never has been. Those there now, they are Jordanians, they're Assyrians, they're Egyptians. About 600,000 had broke through the blockade and landed on the shores of Haffa, Tel Aviv, and then to make their way to Jerusalem. And in 1948, when the vote came down to recognize Israel, the five major Arab nations that surrounded them, Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Syria, and I forgot what, Saudi Arabia, they, they, I, I forget the fifth one, they said, we're going to wipe you off the map. And the armies of the Arabs, begin to marshal their forces to come against Israel. 1948, to destroy them and to wipe them off the map. Israel had nothing. They had no army. They had no army. They had what was called the Haganah, which was just a civilian brigade. They had no weapons. But influential Jews in America and Canada and other places, in spite of Every embargo known to man placed against the transportation of anything into Israel to help the Jews, they began to smuggle weapons in. They needed guns, they needed bullets, they needed medicine. But the one thing they needed the most, they needed an air force. They had zero planes. Until... Two former American fighter pilots, both Jews. Truman had not only put an embargo, but he told every Jewish former serviceman that if they left America to fight for Israel, that they would be stripped of their citizenship and treated as hostile if they tried to return to America. But these two former fighter pilots made their way to Italy to bring to Israel the first two planes to make up the Israeli Air Force. They were two Piper Cubs. Do you know what a Piper Cub is? It's a little putter plane. It's about as long as from there to there. It has two little seats. It's what you teach people to fly on. It's just a little putt-putt plane. Your car can go faster than a Piper Cub. 
They stripped out everything in it. They put plastic fuel tanks in it. And it was, as, as, as one pilot said, it was nothing but a flying Molotov cocktail. If one thing would have gone wrong, it would have exploded in midair. They took off from the coast of Italy, flew 11 and a half hours over the ocean. Never saw a ship, never saw another plane. They had no radio communication to talk to each one. Nothing. It was a flying gasoline can. All they knew was, they knew at the approximate time they were to hit land where they were supposed to land in Israel, there was no landing strip. They had no instruments and it would be at night. And all they had was the word of the Jews that were there saying, when we hear the engines, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. He said, I watched one of those men. Now, I think he's probably passed on now. He said, I didn't know what I was looking for. And all of a sudden, out of the midnight darkness, cans of fire begin to shoot up as they had taken little cans of gas, of oil, and they begin to light them. And he said, we went from smidgen darkness to we had a runway. And we landed. He said, when we got out, they said, they, they rushed us and they began to thank us. And they said, you're the Israeli Air Force. And they looked at each other and looked at those two Piper Cubs and they said, if we're it, we're doomed. They pulled out that temporary fuel tank, filled it back up with gas, filled it up with medicine. And they said, you've got to take off as soon as it's light because convoys trying to bring medicine into our people that are surrounded and besieged have been stopped by the Egyptians and people are dying. And he said, we took off the very, in a few hours, as soon as the sun come up and we landed in the middle of people surrounded by the Arabs of that time in the world and to give medicine and give it. Then we took off again. And then he said, but we've got... They, the Egyptian army, they begin to mobilize as they begin to pull out from Cairo mile after mile after mile of tanks and trucks uh, and anti-aircraft weapons. Uh, they, were, they had the latest of every kind of modern warfare of that day, Egypt had. They were the mightiest army in the Middle East. And it was Iraq. It was Iraq. That was the other country I couldn't think of. They had the second most powerful army. Once again... The call was going out to America. We need fighter pilots. And Jews, I watched them, old, gray-haired, as they was being interviewed, said, I remember one said, I, I, I was not religious. I never went to synagogue one day in my life. I had no interest in my ancestry. But when the call came, something began to stir in me. I remember him saying, I know I'm an American, and I know they may take my citizenship. And I've never set foot in synagogue, but I'm a Jew. And my people need me. And a very powerful, rich American, Jewish man, began to surreptitiously buy airplanes. He brokered a deal with Panama, the Republic of Panama to buy surplus planes and to fly them under the registry of Panamanian Airways. The first thing they needed was C-46 cargo planes, DC-3. They needed to haul cargo. They bought the first one. They were in California getting ready to take off and federal agents drove up in their cars, stopped the pilots and said, you're not getting in that plane. We know where it's going. They looked at it and they said, what are you talking about? This plane belongs to Panama. They said, it does not. There's no markings on it. They looked at each other. They said, wait one minute. 
They turned around, ran into the hangar. About five minutes later, a truck drove out. A guy got out, put up a ladder, walked up the ladder with a paintbrush and a can of paint, stuck it in, and smeared Panamanian Airways across it. Whoa! And they started going, then they started buying fighter planes, trying to get fighter planes, but nobody, they couldn't get these fighter planes from America. And so, one country in the whole world said to Israel, we will sell you arms and airplanes, Czechoslovakia. The only country in the world that said we will sell you airplanes. By now, the Israeli Air Force had risen to, they had eight pilots. And still two Piper Cubs and some cargo planes, but no fighters. Those American fighter pilots arrived in Czechoslovakia. They took them to the airplane factory. What they didn't know was it was a German factory that the Germans had built to build ME 109s, a Mr. Smith 108s, 109s, ME 109s, German fighters. That's what they were going to sell them. Don't tell me God doesn't have a humor. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. The very equipment built to destroy them. Are you awake this morning? And they, they, they said, now, we got one problem. We got two factories. One makes everything out for the plane outside of the engine. But the engine factory burned down. So we're going to have to cobble up some engines. He said, this pilot said, those were the most awful looking engines. He said, literally, things would start falling off. When they had never, they had never flown this plane, they said they walk out and they give them their, fi- their, their uniforms, their altitude uniforms. They're German with the Nazi swastika on it. They're putting them on and they're looking at them, that swastika. One of them whips out a knife, cuts it off. Went over to the other ones, cut off the swastika. He said, here I am. A Brooklyn-born Jew who had never set foot in Israel, going to fight for my homeland, wearing a Nazi uniform, getting into a German-made fighter. Satan meant it for evil, but God was going to turn it to good. Come on, somebody. Come on somebody come on somebody Satan said I'm gonna wipe out a whole nation I'm gonna wipe out a whole race of people so the promises of God will fall flat on its face I have conjured up evil I have raised up Nazi Germany but the God of Abraham was looking down saying buddy you don't have the last word I'm gonna take the very thing you built and I'm gonna use it to save my people. He said, we learn how to fly. He said, literally, you would be in the air and the plane would be shaken. He said, those Czechoslovakians, they didn't know how in the world to build an engine. He said, I'm flying and I'm watching things fall off the plane. I'm saying, oh my God, I'm going to die. They finally got him to Israel, the first four. Now they had six planes, six planes, fighter, two Piper Cubs, four ME-109s, German. They said as soon as they landed, they had, they'd laid down, from, they woke up and said, you gotta go on your first mission. What is it? He said, the Egyptian army is bearing down on us. You've got to attack them. He said, with four planes? They said, four planes. They got up, was walking toward those planes. There was no markings on the planes. And they said, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
every squadron, every, every fighter plane, you got to have numbers on it that tells how many squadrons you have. And one guy looked at the other and said, we're going to be squadron 101. The Egyptians to think there's 101 fighter squadrons. <laughs> they took off and they were just, those planes just shaking. They finally broke through the clouds and they saw that Egyptian army lined up for miles. And one of them, they looked at it and they got on their microphone and said, guys, we may not make it. It's been good knowing you, but let's take it to them. They banked those ME-109, Squadron 101, the four fighters of the Israeli Air Force. They banked out of those clouds and they put them on a direct line and they started dropping those bombs and putting those 50 caliber machine guns on them, blowing up. They said, we started blowing up trucks. We started hitting tanks. We started killing men in those trucks. And then he said, it's just, we made one run. He said, I made my first run. I knocked out several trucks and I'm trying to pull up to gain altitude. And he said, the plane is just blum, 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 blum. I said, oh God, get me up. He said, they're shooting bullets are coming through the wings. And he said, I finally got up. Then I realized that only two had attacked. And I kind of said, where are the others? He said, we can't do anything. The engines are so bad, we're leaking so much oil and gas, we've got to turn around. And they started leaving. And they said, well, we're going to keep making as many passes. Until we run out of bullets and bombs or they shoot us down. But we're not leaving. Those two that had peeled off and going back, they're going back. He said, the one pilot, once again, he said, I'm telling you, the plane was literally falling apart. He said it was like driving a car with four flat tires and trying to drive it fast. He said, I'm shaking all up and around. He said, I was not an observant Jew until that day. And I began to pray every prayer. I could remember my mama who was a devout. I, every, I tried to think of every Hebrew word I could think of that I heard as a little boy. He said, I didn't know what half of them meant, but I was saying them. And he said, all of a sudden, I was flying by the coast because I figured if I'm going to crash, I want to parachute over the water because I have a chance of not getting captured. And he said, all of a sudden, I looked over and I realized I was passing over one of the major ports and pulling into dock, to dry dock, was a huge Egyptian cargo ship carrying weapons and munitions. And I said, I'm going to get one lick in. I'm going to get one lick in. He said, I banked that in me 109, parts falling off. I came through that cloud. He said, I gave it everything. I pushed those fingers down on those machine guns. I dropped the two bombs. And when I pulled up, he said, I looked at a ship exploding behind me with millions of gallons of oil and bullets and things. And, but he said, we got back and then we had four more. Then we had four more. Then we had eight more. Then we had 10 more. And he said, when that, when, that, when that war started in 1948, only 600,000 Jews, every man had to have a weapon. Every woman, they put a gun or a knife in the hands of every woman, every teenager, and even children from 10, the age of 10 and above. Because they had made a vow, never again, never again, never again. Never again. Here we are, here we stay, live or die, but never again. Never again will we let anybody walk all over us. Why don't America take that stand and tell every two-bit dictator and every two-bit Muslim thug, we're sick and tired of it and we're not taking it anymore. Instead, we got a harebrained, crazy senator running for president from Kentucky that says, oh, I'd vote for a Muslim under some circumstances. There is nothing in that skull of yours, not even a brain. There is no circumstances by which we as Americans 
should ever vote for anyone of that nature. Oh, forgive me. We can edit that out. I didn't mean to say that. And they begin. That war started. 600,000 Jews against over a million Arabs with the finest of military armaments. And Israel won. Do you hear what I said? Do you hear what I said? Greater is he. Greater is he. He's greater than your problem. He's greater than your mountain. He's greater than you may be in a storm and your boat's about ready to sink, but there's coming one walking on the water that's about ready to say, peace be still. Hallelujah. Satan is planning your destruction, but God is planning blessing. God is planning blessing. This month is the 60th anniversary of Jimmy Swaggart Ministries. This is our 60th anniversary. This is the longest running television ministry in the history of worldwide television. Dad is the longest running television preacher in the history of television anywhere in the world. Our 60th anniversary. I don't want to go to a lot of detail, but let me just say, I wrote it down this morning. That text I read to you. This ministry has proven that what Satan has meant for evil. That what Satan has meant for evil. What Satan has meant for evil. What Satan has meant for evil. What Satan meant for evil. What Satan meant for destruction. What Satan said, I'm going to wipe you out. I'm going to take you out. I'm going to wipe this ministry off the face of the mouth. But I'm here to tell him what you meant for evil, devil. God has turned it for good. Listen to me. Every time you turn on Sunlight Broadcasting Network, every time you walk into Family Worship Center, every time you open an expositor study Bible, every time you listen to one of our music CDs, every time you read one of the books or one of the commentaries, you are watching, you are seeing, you are listening, you are reading a very miracle that proves Genesis chapter 50 is not a lie, but God will turn the devil's evil and the good you're sitting in a miracle this morning for 27 years we have proved over and over that what Satan meant for evil what Satan meant for evil God has turned it to good Only, only when we get to heaven will you truly know the worldwide impact that this ministry has made and is making. In Brasilia, last weekend preaching, church of several thousand that pastor who is 50 years old steps up before he introduces me and says everything that I have in ministry I owe it to brother Swaggart he said as a teenage boy in Brazil we would turn on the Jimmy Swaggart telecast God called me to preach through that ministry he said, I would watch Brother Swaggart, then I would go out into the streets of Brasilia and preach, try to preach like Brother Swaggart. 
I was having men in their 50s, 60s, they'd walk up to me with tears. My whole family got saved because of the ministry. I'm in ministry today because of the telecast. I don't mean just one here. I mean over and over. Then the the pastor told me something. He said, Brazil is the largest country in South America. It's the United States of South America. He said, prior to the debut of of Brother Swaggart's telecast, there were just a few large churches in Brazil, and most of them were Baptist. He said, now there was a lot of Pentecostal churches, but they were all small. He said, but because of the telecast that brought a wave of Pentecost back to Brazil, he said, every single, now I, this is his words, not mine. Every single mega Pentecostal church in Brazil has its roots in the Jimmy Swagger telecast. Let let me tell you, just singers, musicians, make your way back. In the 1980s, Jim will have to remind me of the date, but in the little African country of Benin, it was supposedly a Muslim country, but at that time it was a communist country. Communist, Marxist. The hammer and sickle was a part of their symbol. Didn't believe in any kind of God, even though they had a Muslim group, they were Marxist. Jim was on his way to another African country and a sandstorm came up. They had to turn around and land in Benin and said, we don't know how long we'll be here. Communist country. Jim went up to customer and said, can I leave the airport and go to the TV department? of this country. He said, no, you don't have a visa. Besides that, you're an American. We don't want you. Walked over, sat back down. A few minutes later, walked up and said, hey, if you send one of your policemen with me that's here in the airport, he'll make sure I get back. Will you do that? The guy said, oh, okay. So Jim and a cop, and the cop got his hand on a gun watching him get in the cab and they go to, it's a French speaking country, they go to the television, Department of Television. Jim had a little briefcase. In that briefcase, when you opened it up, it was something like out of James Bond. I'm serious, for that day. It opened up and it was built in it was a portable VHS player. I, it, I mean, he'd pop it up, open a screen, pop in a tape. There, there. Hey, Jim, if I get something wrong, you yell out and correct me because you did it. I'm just telling it. But he's walking it, and he, they get there, they stop, and a man, a young man walks up right to him and says, can I help you? And he said, yes, I want to see the television director. Okay, come with me. Brought him up to the television, said, sit right here. Walked over, spoke to some man at the desk. The man looked over and said, okay, okay, okay. And the young man walked out. And Jim, now Jim can't speak French. He can speak a little bit. The guy couldn't speak English, the head of director. So he brought us over. Anyway, he said, what do you want? I'm here to present to you the opportunity at no charge to you. To air the most popular French speaking program in Africa. Oh, what is it? He opened up that briefcase, popped in that tape. 
And it was the Kingston, Jamaica crusade that had been translated into French. And he's watching it and they, and they start calling other people in and they said, we'll take it. Now this is a communist country. A communist country ruled by a communist dictator. Jim grabbed a piece of paper, wrote out a contract. Said, we'll start supplying. What's the air they gave me? We'll start supplying tapes immediately. Then he said, can you tell me where that young man is that spoke English so I can thank him? He goes, that, that young man that spoke to me? Yeah. I don't know who that was. I thought he was with you. I've never seen him before in my life. I don't know who he is. I thought he was with you. And Jim said, I don't know who he was. Got back, in, got back to the airport. I mean, in the guards. We got to go. We got to go. We got to go. Got back to the airport. Make a long story short, they started airing the telecast in this Marxist country. The also, hammer and sickle was a part of their logo. Also Muslim and capital of voodoo. That's right. It was the, Benin was the leading practitioner of voodoo in all of Africa. Demon spirits. And one, after the program had been on two or three months, and a very luxuriously appointed for a little Marxist African country house set a man. By himself watching that program. When the altar call came, this man sitting there by himself watching that program in French. His name was Matthew Caracou. When dad gave the altar call, he stood up out of his seat by himself, knelt down in front of the TV set and gave his heart to Jesus Christ. He was the communist dictator of Benin. He got up in a few days before the country and said, I renounce communism. I am now a born again Christian and I repent before my country for all that has happened and I am instituting democratic reforms and we're going to have a free election he ran for president he lost but the very next election he ran and was elected. You can Google his name and look up Wikipedia. You can, it's there. It will tell you he was once a communist, but he embraced their term evangelical Christianity. And now the country, even though it was a majority Muslim as far as religion was back then, Today, Benin is a majority Christian country. Oh, hallelujah. 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 What Satan meant for evil, God will turn it to good. But let me, let me just finish with the last words. Let me read that. But as you, but as for you, you thought evil against us. But God meant it for good. For good. Now let me stop right there. I don't want to repeat what we went through. But it made something out of us. The fire purified. We became sharpened. Oh, I, I know you do. <laughs> we didn't understand what was going on. But God had a plan. I said, God had a plan. 
But as for you, you thought evil against us, but God meant it for good. To bring to pass. As it is this day. To save much people alive. Why do you think he's raised up SBN around the world? To save much people alive. 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 Oh, oh, oh. But look, then he said, now, therefore, fear you not. Fear not. I will nourish you. Can somebody shout? I will nourish you. If I have to send food by a raven, I will nourish you. If I have to send manna from heaven, I will nourish you. And I can say, hey, he has nourished us. But not just, notice this, and your little ones. And your little ones. Come here. Come here. And your little ones. I'm not just going to nourish you. I'm not just going to nourish you, but I'm going to nourish your little ones because there is still much land yet to possess. There is still much land yet to possess. There is still much land to possess. What Satan meant for evil, God turned it for good. God made it good. God made it good. And here's what I've come to tell you this morning. That promise is for you. That promise is for every one of you watching, every one of you listening right now. The doctor has said you're going to die. Your wife says, I don't love you anymore. Your children may be in sin and rebellion. The creditor is knocking at the door. Your boat's taking water. You're in the middle of the wilderness and you're thirsty. You don't have anything to eat spiritually. You haven't had anything to drink spiritually. But I got news for you. Moses is about ready to step up with a rod and he's going to strike a rock. Hollywood ain't got nothing on what God can do. You're sitting in the middle of pain and suffering right now. You can feel the evil hand of Satan as it feels like spiritually he's trying to squeeze the very life out of you. But I'm here to tell you this morning. If you don't quit, if you don't stop, if you keep believing God, the very thing Satan designed to destroy you, he'll turn it, put it into your hands for your good. (laughs) We're living proof. And so are you. Stand to your feet, everybody in this building. Just lift your hands and begin to worship all across this building. If you're facing a Jericho wall, If there's a Red Sea or a Jordan River in front of you and you don't know what to do, I want you to get out from where you are. I want you to come and stand around this octagon. And we're going to go out of this place with a shout of victory. Whatever you're facing, spiritual, physical, financial, domestic, emotional, whatever it is, whatever evil Satan has marked against you, God's going to turn it to good. God's going to turn it to good. Come on, step out.
altar this morning. Lift those hands right now. Tell the devil. Let me go. Put that situation in the hands of God. Just a moment for your need, what you're facing, but also what we need Monday and Tuesday. But I want us to change the song and I want us to sing, we are able to go up and possess the country, possess the land from Jordan to the sea. Yes. Though there be giants our way to hinder, our God, our God, his name is not Buddha. It's not Muhammad or Allah or Confucius, but our God, his name is Jehovah. His name is Jesus Christ. He has given us the victory. And there is no giant that can stand in the path of our heavenly David. He's already, here's what you got to understand. It's not a case of him winning the victory for you. The victory's already been won. And I want them to sing it, and I want you to sing it like it's the last time that you're going to sing it, and you know the trump of God is going to sound. And I want you to sing it like that. I mean with all the energy you got, because this is a time of victory. This is a time of victory. This is a time of walking out of the house with a little dance in our feet, a little praise on our lips, a little shout in our hands. All right, you got me, you got me, you got me. You see, when the Christians, you know, they make fun of us Pentecostals. Look at that emotional hour. Did you see that preacher in the green suit? He was just dancing around. What they don't, what them imbeciles don't know. Every time we pick up our foot, we're saying, greater is he. Every time we put it down, we're saying, devil, you're defeated. Greater is devil, you're defeated. Oh, oh, oh wait. Just give me one, give me, just give me one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute. Just one minute to tell you. Oh, this work, this is beautiful. It just comes in my mind. There's a lot of stuff up there. Sometimes it don't need to come out. <laughs> South Africa. Preaching in a huge coliseum. Thousands. I love, so I'll be back there next year. Been there, tw this trip next year will make the 28th trip. Sunday afternoon, pull up park. I'm walking through the tunnel out to the field and all of a sudden I hear some singing. And when I get to the end of the tunnel, lined up on either side all the way to the steps of the platform. Lined up on each side were African women in their traditional African dress, singing and dancing. And this is what they were singing. They were singing, higher, 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 lift Jesus higher, lower, 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 stamp Satan lower, higher, 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 lift Jesus higher, lower, lower, lower. And I'm telling you, chill bumps broke out all over me. Electricity started flowing through me. I mean, I'm walking through them, looking at them, and they're going, higher, 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 lift Jesus higher, lower, 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 stamp Satan lower. Oh, I'm telling you, we had thousands baptized in the Holy Spirit that day. Today, when we're singing, we're going to be pushing the devil lower, lower, lower. And we're going to be lifting Jesus higher and higher. Because we are able to go up and possess the land. Come on.
the name of Jesus. Every child of God here, everyone watching, everyone listening, no matter the evil that Satan has planned, plotted, is trying to carry out against them, we stand upon the promise of your word that God will turn it to good. Just as you did for Joseph so long ago, you're still doing it for your children today. We speak it by faith. Be it done in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we need a miracle on Monday. We need a miracle on Tuesday. We've got some land to possess, Lord. Move upon the the hearts of your children and as they respond to that voice begin to bless them and move in their hearts and move in their lives as they never thought possible and everybody said amen, amen. one more time well we are able to go up and take the country and possess the land from Jordan to the sea blessed and enjoyed this live Family Worship Center service. Family Worship Center in Baton Rouge, Louisiana holds three services weekly, Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Central Time and Wednesday at 7 p.m. Central Time. To become a member of the Family Worship Center Media Church, call 800-288-8350 or go to jsm.org. All services are broadcast live on the Sun Life Broadcasting Network, including Sun Life Radio and online at sunlifetv.com.